Something that is interesting to me is that when I talk to people and I've interacted with people over the years in ministry, both in youth ministry, serving as pastor, and everywhere in between, it seems like there's a lot of people, a high number of people, that aren't really excited and aren't really experiencing much joy in their faith and in their relationship with Christ. Where church attendance and serving almost turns into a habit, something that you just do. You, you come in, you, you sit in a chair, you worship, you serve. You might serve once a month in preschool or, or whatever, but, but there's not really this joy, this excitement, this sense of uh, abundant life that Christ promises us. And as I thought about that, one of the, the things I've heard a lot over the years is people will say, well, I used to enjoy it, but something happened. And a lot of times they'll share a, you know, a bad experience, something that, a bad experience they had at church or, or, or something else that kind of, they'll say, rob them of that joy, and now it's just not the same. And as I thought about that, it didn't really make a lot of sense to me um, as I thought about that over the years. That's what I've heard probably at least 90% of the time. Now, I don't know if you can relate to that. I don't know if some of you sitting there when I start talking about joy and excitement and church attendance and, and your relationship with Christ, if, if that strikes a chord or a nerve with you, if, if when you came to church today, if you were excited, if when you walked through the door, if you had joy in your heart, whether you were just coming to be a part of the church or coming to serve. But when I thought about the, the, the rationale behind a bad experience changed it for me. That just doesn't make sense to me. It really doesn't. I mean, think about it for a second. We've all had a bad experience at a restaurant, right? Haven't we? In fact, Mary and I were talking the other day. I've had food poisoning at least three times. Like seriously, three times. And one of those was right before an a Alpha Omega youth worship service, and I had to put a trash can behind the podium. Like it, seriously. But guess what? I didn't decide I'm never going to a restaurant again. And I didn't decide that I can't have joy going to a restaurant again, Right? Um, there's all kinds of things that when we start to think about this, in fact, let, let's just talk about this for a second. What about cable TV or your internet provider? Is that always a joyous experience? Or you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I can't take it, I can't take it, right? Even other things in life, right? Like um, just trying to be nice. I try to be nice to everybody. I, I truly do. I really do. And I said, I shared this years and years ago, but, but I had an experience once. I was just trying to be nice. I'm at Kroger and I'm, I'm, you know, cashing out my groceries, and there's a line of people, and there's someone bagging, and I'm just trying to be nice, trying to make some small talk, right? And, and, and this is in no way making fun of the individual, what I'm about to share with you. It's making fun of me, okay? So I'm just trying to be nice, and the guy walks around to do something, and when he walks around, he's walking with a limp, and I'm like, oh, hey, buddy. I said it real loud. Hey, buddy, what'd you do to your leg? And he says to me, kind of put out, just part of my disability, sir. And everybody's looking at me like, what an idiot. And I'm just like, uh, you know, felt about that big. But did that stop me from ever being nice to people again? No, of course not. You see, what I want you to understand is that sometimes it, we allow things to start to rob us of the joy and excitement that we just shouldn't because they should be exciting and joyful just because they are. Today, I want us to take a look and how to get excited about your faith. My hope and my goal today in this final sermon to you is that you will leave here excited about what God is doing in your lives, excited about the opportunity to serve him, excited about the opportunity to grow in your relationship with him, and excited about helping your church family and your church build the kingdom of God. As we continue worshiping, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, that we have right now to worship you. Lord, we ask that you'd bless the reading of your word. Lord, we ask that you would just open our eyes, open our heart. Lord, may we receive the truth found in your word. And Lord, when we leave this place today, may we leave here joyful. May we leave here excited about what you're doing both today and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives, because, Lord, you truly are amazing. Thank you for loving us. Lord, I ask now that you would just speak clearly through me. We pray all this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.
you got your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 6, and we're going to begin with verse 30. One of my top 10 favorite passages in the Bible. Uh, let me just give you the, the snapshot of it. You're very familiar with it as well. This is the account where Jesus feeds the 5,000 men, right? I love this account because it, it's so simplistic, it's so miraculous, and it begs the question of how powerful God is and how he could do things in so many different ways. But he chooses to do them in a very specific way. Look with me at Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. Now, let's just stop here for a second. So the apostles come back, and they're talking to Jesus, giving him a report, sharing testimony of all the amazing things they had done and taught, and, and it's such an amazing time, and, and then people start gathering around, and Jesus recognized that they're exhausted, which, by the way, that would have meant that he's tired as well from serving and, and doing everything that he always did, and that they needed to eat and get some rest. So he says, hey, guys, let's, let's take a break. Let's all get in the boat, and we're going to go on off to a solitary place. He loved all the crowds that were coming, but he wanted to get his, his closest people to a solitary place where they could just kind of recharge their batteries, right? They get in the boat, and as they're going, people start to follow them, all kinds of people. And when they finally get there, and they're, they're getting off the boat, there's already a huge crowd waiting on them. And the scripture says that Jesus had compassion on them. He saw them. They were tired. He was tired. The apostles were tired, but this group of people was coming because they wanted to hear more, and Jesus didn't want to deny them that, so, so he had compassion on them, and he begins to teach, and now here they are in this remote place, and it's getting up in the, in the hours of the day to the point where, keep in mind, this isn't like modern times. There aren't restaurants all up and down. There weren't roads nearby because this is a solitary place, and the apostles finally come to Jesus and say, hey, we're going to have to let these people go so they can get some food. They can go into the surrounding countryside and the villages and try to get some food. This is an amazing setup. This whole scene is amazing. And it brings me to this. Three things when we start talking about how to get excited about your faith. First is this. You've got to be available to serve the Lord. You've got to be available to serve the Lord. The apostles in this account were already wiped out. They came and they were, they were sharing testimony. They were talking about, about spiritual victory for the kingdom with Jesus. And all kinds of other people came and they were trying to interact with them. But they were hungry and they were tired. And Jesus said, all right, let's, let's take a break. Let's take a break. Understand this. The apostles were available already. They had already been serving. But then they get in a boat and when they go away, more people show up. Jesus has compassion. They start doing their thing again because they were available. They were in the right place at the right time as they had been throughout Jesus' ministry from the time he called them. They were right there listening to what the Savior had to say over and over and over. In fact, when you think about this whole thing of being available to serve the Lord, being available, just making yourself available, it's something that's quite unique. In fact, I think a lot of people think they're available, but they're really not. They want to play games in their mind. In fact, I, I really do believe this, that, that we as humans, we think we're so smart, but we're really pretty stupid. Would you agree with that? Yes. <laughs> Don't point at people. Don't. Some of you are like, yeah. No, I'm just. Um, we, we think we're so smart, and we've got it all figured out, but I'm convinced that we kind of play games. You don't think that, that humans are stupid? Let me just read to you some statements from the court of law. Are you ready? These are real statements, just little snapshots. 
What gear were you in at the moment of the impact? Gucci sweats and Reeboks. How old is your son, the one living with you? 38 or 35, I can't remember which. How long has he lived with you? 45 years. What was the first thing your husband said to you when he woke that morning? He said, where am I, Kathy? And why did that upset you? My name is Susan. Sir, what is your IQ? Well, I can see pretty well, I think. Some of you will get that later on. Did you blow your horn or anything? Do you mean after the accident? Before the accident? Sure, I played for 10 years. I even went to school for it. Can you describe the individual? He was about medium height and had a beard. Was this a male or a female? And finally, all your responses must be oral, okay? What school did you go to? Oral. This, these are statements actually out of the court of law. So, so these are people trying to, to, to make a defense or to try to prosecute somebody, bring in their all, bring in their best. Kind of stupid, right? We all struggle with this. We're all a little dense at times. And I think that when you hear me say a statement like, the very first thing to look at in terms of being excited about your faith, really being excited, is to be available to serve. I think most of us in our head, we go, I'm available. When in reality, you may not be available. See, to be available to serve, there's a couple of things to think about from the church setting alone. It means you have to be involved. That means to be available, you have to be involved. You have to know what the needs are. You have to be there. Um, you have to, to be there enough that, that you can jump in and be in, involved on some level. That means steady attendance. That means coming on a regular basis. Do you know that, uh, and this is just a weird thing for me over the years, um, I've always felt like, obviously I was the pastor, so that was weird, but even before, if, if I missed a bunch of Sundays, but even before that, if I remember vividly back when I was working with the student ministry, I was in the Ohio Army National Guard, and I would have to miss one weekend a month, and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I felt like when I missed one weekend a month, when I came back, I missed all kinds of stuff that happened at church. Like I did, I, I didn't like it. I, I missed people joining the church, people coming to know Christ, people getting baptized. I missed all kinds of stuff. And, and a lot of people would say, well, that's just one Sunday a month. And it, I could for sure say, well, that was my job. I had to, and I had no choice. I did have to, but it really bothered me. And yet when I reflect on this now, I think a lot of people in this vein of lacking excitement in your faith and your relationship with Jesus, I think missing one Sunday a month to you is no big deal. It's like, whatever, I'm there 75% of the time. But the reality of it is what happens is you miss one Sunday a month, and then all of a sudden you get into the sports grind. you got stuff going on with your kids or family or whatever, and you start traveling. If you line up, you only got 52 Sundays a year. If you're missing one a month, subtract 12. If you start missing two a month or, or another 10 somewhere, now you're not even here half the time, and you're missing out on the big things that are happening in church. Now, I've never led you as your pastor by guilt, never. I've never walked up to someone and said, hey, where you been? Now, I've talked bad about you behind your back. No, I'm just kidding. I've never walked up and, and said those kind of things to you. But here's the truth. Listen to me for a second. You want, to be, you want to get excitement in your faith and in your relationship with Christ? You've got to be available to serve. That means that you've got to be involved, and that means you've got to have some steady attendance some steady attendance. I would challenge each and every one of you right now to make, a, make a, a list and say, okay, these are the only reasons we're gonna miss church. But it's not just worship. A lot of you don't even attend Sunday morning Bible study and that's the perfect time to get to know other people, to connect on a deeper level. As the church grows larger, it's gotta grow smaller. That's where the deep connections come. I've said over and over over the years that if you have three significant relationships in the church, you'll say it's the greatest church ever. But if you don't have three significant relationships, there's a good chance that in the short future, whether it be one, two, three, five years, you'll eventually drift back out because you don't feel connected. The Bible study classes, they're for all ages, and that's an easy way to connect with people. That's an easy way to start getting involved. Other things, learning. Learning so you understand what God's expectations are for us as Christians. In addition, growing spiritually. 
through all the spiritual disciplines, not just Bible study, but prayer and, and fellowship and all the five purposes we just talked about last series. You see, these things are important, and these things are, when you say, I'm available to serve, these are what should be evident in your life. If they're not, if you're not here but 50% of the time, you're probably not going to get involved because you're, one, going to feel like I can't be committed to that, or two, you're going to feel like, well, I don't really know what the needs are, so I'm not willing to step in. Make up your mind right now. Say, I'm going to be here. This is my church. I'm going to jump in. I want to experience the joy of my salvation and the abundant life that Christ promises me. That's step one. Second step is to be obedient when the opportunity arises. Let's keep reading in our text today. So the apostles say to Jesus, hey, um, we need to let these people go because they're, gonna, they're hungry. They need to go in the surrounding countryside and villages. Verse 50, 37 and following. But he answered, Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Now, you guys know that account. I've, you've read it. You've heard it. All of that. But, but when you start to really think about it, so the apostles were there. They were, they were able to, to be used. They were in a position to be able to be used. But the second step was they had to be obedient when the opportunity arises. They had to be obedient. So they came to Jesus and said, we got to let these people go. They got to eat. And Jesus turns it back on them and says, you feed them. Now, just for a second, I want you to think about this. We talk in terms that God's all-powerful. Have you ever thought of all the many ways God could have used to feed these people? Have you ever thought about that? Think about it. He could have said, I'm going to introduce you to one of the greatest things known to man, and I'm going to make it rain Holtman's Donuts on you people. And they could have eaten Holtman's Donuts, right? Best day of their lives. They, I don't know what this is. This is great. You know, that kind of thing. But he could have made Big Macs appear. He could have immediately satisfied their hunger. He could have immediately made manna pop out of the ground like he did in days of old. He's God. He's all-powerful. He could have done it any number of ways. He, hear me on this. He did not need humans to do this. He didn't. He did not need the apostles to do this miracle. He didn't. He chose to use them. He didn't need them. He chose to use them. So he says, you feed them. And then they're like, we don't have any food. And he says, how much do you have? So they take an inventory. They're walking around. Hey, who's got some food? And they come up with the five loaves and the two fish. And they bring it up to Jesus. We got five loaves and two fish. And they're fully expecting him to go, okay, good point. Send them away. Then what's he say? Have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And then Jesus blesses the food. And then he hands it to them and says, start giving it to them. Have you ever thought about what an incredible, obedient moment that was? Think about that for just a minute. Look around the room. There's a bunch of you today. Look around the room. What would you think if I walked out and I had like a loaf of bread, one loaf, and I said, all right, I'm going to feed all of you with this. And I start breaking pieces off. Are you thinking that anything is of substance is going to get to you at all? It would be like a little crumb, a little piece, right? And yet all these people, the scripture says 5,000 men, so there would have been women and children as well. So it's not outside the realm at all to think it was 10,000 plus probably were there. And they've got five loaves, and they weren't like giant loaves either. They were just normal loaves and two fish. And he starts to hand it to them. Have you ever thought for a second that that's only seven pieces of food and there were 12 apostles to begin with? You ever thought about that? So they're like, okay. And they start, so, so they had a choice. That was an obedient moment. Some of them may have thought, it may have crossed their mind. I'm going to look like a fool. Everybody sit in groups. Here you go. Right? That's what my thought would have been. 
But instead, they're obedient. Now, we don't know all the dialogue between them. What we do know is that they were faithful. And we know that the people all sat down because the people weren't sure exactly what was going on. They weren't privileged to the dialogue between Jesus and his apostles, right? So they all sit down, the apostles are going around, and they start feeding them. They start feeding them. They start feeding them. And they go all the way around, all 12 apostles, all the way around. And when they finally get done, the scripture says everybody was satisfied. That word satisfied means full, not wanting more. It's like when you're sitting at a restaurant, and you're like, oh, man, I'm oh, no, no more. They're sitting in these, these groups on this green grass, and they're totally full. Have you ever thought for just a second what the apostles were doing? Because they were all spread out. There were 12 of them, right? And they're going around feeding them. Can you picture the glances they were giving each other as they're going from this group of 50 to this group of 50 to this group of Can you picture for a second? And, and how did it work? Did they break the bread and it grew back? How did, how did that work? Like, where's the camera? Where's the Snapchat for that? You know, what's that? Look at this. Miracle, miracle. It was happening through their hands. Can you picture just for a small second as they're doing it, can you just picture, picture Peter looking over at John going, and he keeps feeding. Can you picture the joy that they were having, all of them, as these, as these people are eating, and then just to show the fullness of how amazing God is, he leaves 12 basketfuls of scraps for him to carry him back up. Just for the visual. They get done, and then they're picking it all up, and they walk up, and they got this huge this bushel of scraps from five loaves, two fish, seven pieces of food. Let me tell you something. The apostles were experiencing joy and excitement at what God was doing. They were overwhelmed with, with, with just pleasure. And know this, God did it that way on purpose because he could have fed those people a million different ways, but he chose to use his people who were first and foremost available to serve. Then he gave them the challenge, and they were obedient when the situation presented itself. And out of that obedience, all these people were fed. And we look at, when we look at all this, what we find is that these, this enormous crowd of people are fed. The people probably are picking up on some excitement between the apostles, but the people that really had the joy, the greatest joy and excitement, were the 12 apostles. Because understand this, the three things to do, how to get excited about your faith, be available to serve the Lord, be obedient when the opportunity arises, and third, be ready to see the glory of God. Be ready to see the glory of God. They experienced it firsthand. The people, they just got a free meal. They experienced it in its fullness. Can you imagine what they did with Jesus when they brought the basketfuls back up? What did they say to him? What do you think they said? Do you think they said, good job, fist bump? What do you think they did? Do you think they looked at him and said, that was amazing? Do you think they hugged him? Do you, what, what do you think was going on there? Get real for just a minute. I bet you they came back and worshiped. I bet you they came back and were overwhelmed that they were used to do such an amazing miracle when God could have done it a million different ways. See, here's the truth. Some of you, you've lost your excitement some of you, you've lost the joy of your salvation and, a, and of the, your relationship with Christ. And it's because you're not available to serve. Whether it be, you know, attendance that's sporadic. Whether it's you're just not willing to. Whether it's you're not learning, you're not growing. You're missing out. You're in a habit. You go through the motions. What, insert whatever. Some of you aren't experiencing the joy and excitement because you've been here a lot. You've seen the opportunities arise, but you've not been obedient. You've, you've thought, ah, I can't do that. I've got this, 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 and this. But understand this. Many times in ministry service, in the church and in the church arm into the community, most of the people are just experiencing joy or food or an inflatable or insert whatever. Only the ones on the inner circle that were available to serve, that were obedient to serve, only that group are the ones that really see the glory of God. Only that group are the ones that seriously raise their hand up in a brave heart moment and go, yes! Only that group are the ones that worship God in a, in a more powerful way, in a more focused way. Only that group gets excited about the next opportunity because they know that God is so, so good. 
it's very different than just going through the motions. It's very different than lacking excitement and kind of dragging yourself to church. My hope and my prayer for each of us is that we would be excited as we see the glory of God. Let me close with this. I can tell you this with complete certainty. I am a sinner. I am not perfect. Not even close. Not even close. Those of you that are close to me, you know that. In fact, some of you are like, yeah, right? But here's what I know. God has been good to me. He has never failed me. I failed him, but he's never failed me. But I can tell you this as well. I do have an excitement and a joy in my faith and in my relationship with Christ. It's not based on on anything awesome that I've done. Literally, all I've done is try my very best to be available to serve. Try my very best to be obedient when the, the opportunity arises, whatever that looks like. And it seems over and over and over in big and small ways, God's, God reveals his glory. And it's the greatest part of my life and my family's lives. As we talk about it, as we reflect on it, God has been so good to us. And he wants to be so good to you too. The challenge is that we get so caught up that we forget what it's all about. I don't want you to forget what it's all about. I want you to experience the fullness, the joy and the excitement and the abundant life that Christ promises. And I'm convinced that only happens when we truly roll up our sleeves and begin to serve him. When that happens, you're well on your way to experiencing all that Christ has in store for you. I don't know what God's speaking to you about, I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to have our deacons come down here in just a minute. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, this is your moment. Come down. These deacons would love to share with you how you can pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. If you're here today and it's been a long time since you've truly experienced the joy of your salvation, just ask God to speak to your heart. And Whatever he asks you to do, you just do it. Don't put it off for another day. Do it so that you can get back on track and experience all that God has in store for you. Let's pray together as our deacons come. Father God, thank you so much for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us to worship you. And Lord, we just praise and we thank you for this account of the feeding of the 5,000. Lord, we praise you on so many levels because we know that you could have done it in any number of a million ways, but yet you chose to use your apostles. And Lord, we know that's the same thing you want to do with us. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being a good God. Thank you for being a faithful God. Thank you for being a God that still wants to use us, even though we truly are dirtbag failures. We love you, Father. We pray all this in your Son, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? I was alone. I was in chains, world had a hold of me. My heart was a stone, I was covered in shame when he came for me. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms, Jesus. He loves me. He loves me. He is for me. And Jesus, how can it be? He loves say a prayer as our ushers come just a reminder there's offering baskets on the right side of each row if you wouldn't mind grabbing those and passing them down the road to the other side and our ushers will greet you there let's pray together as our ushers come lord thank you so much for the blessing of worshiping you today lord thank you for being the god who's the giver of all good gifts 
And Lord, we just ask right now as we come to this time in the service where we give these tithes and offerings back to you. Lord, we know that you've commanded us to do this. But Lord, it's the joy of our heart because Lord, you're everything to us. Bless these resources. Multiply them now. We pray all this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you've had a great time worshiping the Lord this morning. I'm going to ask uh, Matt, Amy, and Harley, and Skyler, and Grace, and Josie, and Gavin to all come right up here and sit on this front row. Come on down, you guys. Come on down. So right after the service, um, I would like all of you as a church family to come. I know we're going to be setting stuff up and doing things, but come by and celebrate their baptism and get excited for them. And um, uh, before I, I uh, turn it over to, to Mike Smith, I do just want to tell you, it's been the joy of my heart to be your pastor. I love each of you dearly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You are a very special church family. I'll be praying for you. I will miss you. I ask that you pray for my wife and I as we figure out the next step that God has for us. And make sure you aggravate my kids that will be running around here still, all right? But we love you. It's been amazing. Let me say a prayer real quick. Let's pray together. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. And Lord, thank you for the opportunity for each and every one of us to serve you. Thank you for the blessing of me serving here with these amazing people for these, these years. And Lord, I do ask that you continue to bless this church. May it be all that you've called it to be. May it accomplish amazing things for your kingdom. But Lord, most of all, I pray that they would have joy and faith experience the abundant life that you've promised them as they continue to grow closer to you and accomplish your will for them individually as well. Thank you for loving us. We pray all this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Please pray for me. I'm emotional this morning. <laughs> First, I want to thank Ron and Mary Beth for their service here at Fellowship. Uh, they've served nine plus years here at Fellowship, served many, many families. Um, blessed a whole lot of people in this community, outside of our congregation and in this state and in other parts of this country through the mission work and stuff that Ron's led us through. But today I want to talk to you a little bit I didn't really realize what it meant to be a pastor until I saw uh, firsthand working side by side with Ron for the Lord. I didn't realize the strain that a pastor has on them for loving on the congregation the way he does. 
A few weeks back, he talked about people being hard to love. That's true. A lot of occasions we're hard to love. Myself, everybody here included. But through those nine years that I've got to know Ron well and through the, the work God's done here, like he talked about today, it's been a blessing to be standing alongside him and serving in that way. What I've seen in the last nine years, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people that Ron's led to the Lord. What have I seen? I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people that Ron's baptized here at Fellowship. What a blessing today was for him to end his time here at Fellowship as pastor in that way this morning, seven people being baptized for the Lord. I've been side by side with Ron when I've saw miracles happen before us. I've seen the dedication that that man has had to always doing the right thing. If I, when he told us a month ago that he was leaving today, he told us he, he felt God was leading him to a different part of his life. If I thought for one minute that I could talk him out of that selfishly, I would, because I hate to see him go. Ron has been a valuable servant to us, my family, to the congregation. I've said this before. I wish you guys could have seen the times that I have seen with Ron. I've seen the times where Ron's strong in a meeting where a family member has passed away or a horrible thing has happened in their life. He stayed strong as their pastor while he's there, and when they leave the room... He breaks down and falls to the floor and cries and prays for him. I've seen the Ron where have, people have hurt Ron personally. I've seen him turn the other cheek and just pray for him and cry out for hurt for him. I wish you guys could have seen that part that I've seen because it's been a blessing in my life that I can't even describe to you. So I won't take any more time right now as a congregation. I got prepared words. I wanted to just speak from the heart to you guys. I want you to know, and I think most of you do, what a blessing God has given you, given you over the last nine years. Don't take my sadness today as that I'm not happy for Ron going forward. I'm excited for him because I know one thing. If God's moving him like this and making changes like this, the next step for Ron, for this church, you better hold on because it's going to be an exciting ride. So as we go out today, tell Ron how much he's loved, he's loved Mary Beth, his family, how much they've gave for you guys personally and for the congregation. Tell him how much you love him. If you brought cards for Ron and Mary Beth and his family today, there's a box out on the information booth, and during the meal we'll probably have it on the back wall. As we leave here today, I ask you guys to help us. We're going to have everybody come up front, greet them as they you come by first before we do anything. Tell them how proud you are of them, how excited you are for them, that they've joined fellowship and they love the Lord. I ask you guys after you go by and greet to stack chairs eight high. And what we're going to do, the lunch is going to be right after this. So we're going to stack chairs eight high and get them to the sides real quick. We're going to pull the tables out and set up as many tables as we have, around 38 tables. Um, then I'll come back up and we'll release table rows like we do for Thanksgiving dinner for the food, which is in the side rooms over here. I think everybody could smell that as we've been along this morning. I'm hungry. So the food's all over here. We'll release tables to go and eat. There'll be baskets on the head of the table like we do for Wednesday night dinner, where if you can donate to that, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, today has been hard for Ron and his whole family as we go from here 
Pray for them daily. Pray for the next step that God has for them and the next service that he's going to fall into and his family will fall into for God. Take that and do that daily for him. That will mean more to him than anything you can do. Thank you, guys.